Good morning, Lansing. Let's read today's passage and open in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 to 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Let's pray. Father God, what we know not, teach us. What we see not, show us. And what we are not, make us for your glory. Amen. Sometimes I notice a social media account that is a joking account called the Unappreciated Pastor or at Reverend No Respect on Twitter. He had a good one this past week saying the top 10 ways that his church thinks the coronavirus is like his preaching. Number 10, it just keeps getting worse. Number nine, people are constantly asking, is it over yet? Number eight, the young folks aren't taking it seriously. Number seven, you're probably not going to get it. Number six, the people most affected by it are senior citizens. Number five, it makes you want to stay at home. Number four, it has shut down a lot of churches. Number three, people are making a lot of grocery lists. Number two, people want it to hurry up and end so they can be the first to the restaurant. And number one, once it started, everyone had to go to the bathroom. Thankfully, those things are hopefully not true about his preaching and not true about our preaching here at Lansing either. And truth be told, some of those things are not true about the virus either. For example, the virus doesn't keep getting worse, it's actually getting better. But nonetheless, this was a pretty funny post. Around Reformation Day, Reverend No Respect posted, We need more people like Martin Luther in our church. At least he only found 95 things wrong with his church. If you don't get that joke, you need to do some studying. Another good one he wrote was, Social distancing? Is that when some people you pastor see you at the mall and duck into the nearest store to avoid having to say hello? One last one, though I could go on and on. He's pretty funny. He wrote in October, Happy Pastor Appreciation Month, everybody. Or as we call it at our church, Passover. <laughs> and then one more, actually. I'll, and I'll promise I'll get on with the meat of the sermon. He wrote uh, a little while back, I finally convinced my church to buy a bus and people are already lining up to throw me under it. If this unappreciated pastor or so-called Reverend No Respect were a real person, I would think that his church could benefit from today's sermon passage. Because today's passage at the start of the final instructions of 1 Thessalonians says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. It would be awkward for me to spend too much time on these two verses because I'm a pastor and it would seem like I'm standing up here in a self-serving way saying, everyone should respect me more. But Thankfully, Lansing is a very loving church, very respectful church, so this is not an area that I think we need particular admonishing in. But we will go through the verses. I'm not going to skip over them, of course. They're here in front of us today. Let's go through them somewhat quickly, stopping along some key words as we go. First key word that I see there, I'm sure you see it as well, is the call to respect the pastors and elders who are in view in this verse. This is not the only time in the Bible that pastors and elders are said to be respected, told uh, in Ephesians, or rather in Hebrews 13, 17, and 1 Timothy 5, 17, they say very similar things about respecting those over you in the Lord, except even more strongly. The Bible also teaches 
to respect leaders in other spheres as well, such as parents and government. God is a God of order, and he has instituted order within the sphere of the family and within the sphere of the church and within the sphere of the government and public life. As long as those are not going against the Bible, we are to follow them. It doesn't mean that you can't disagree with the government or write a letter to your MP or your MPP because that is part of the order of things, the way government works, but it should, they should be respected. Also, it doesn't mean you can't disagree with your pastor if he teaches something that's incorrect or he has a personal preference that is not shared by everybody else, but they should be respected. Lansing does well at this. I'm blessed to be part of this church family as a pastor, and the other pastors and elders here would say the same thing. The next word I see in verse 2 is those who labor among you. And the word labor is a Greek word which absolutely means labor. It means hard work, growing weary and tired because of expending much energy. From this verse, I would point out that it doesn't say to respect your pastors and elders who are lazy lumps on a log, but those who labor, those who are working hard among you. This verse is mainly addressed to the church family in Thessalonica and to a church family, but there is something for the pastors and elders of a church family to learn from it as well. We are assumed to be and supposed to be very hard workers. Occasionally when I'm partly done preaching a sermon, I listened to Pastor Alistair Begg from Cleveland and his ministry called Truth for Life, and I listened to him preach on the same passage to make sure I didn't miss anything and as an additional study aid, and I did that for the first time in quite a while this past week to see what he had to say about this passage, and I found it very interesting that he spent over half his sermon from these verses talking to the pastors and elders and reminding them that they should be hard workers, laboring for the Lord and his church. He actually said that in some churches, the men of the congregation, or those many people from the congregation, have been at work for hours while the pastor is still at home in his slippers. And that's just not right. And I agreed with him, and I immediately took off my slippers that I had been wearing up to that point. Obviously, these are strange times, and many of us are working from home these days and possibly wearing slippers if our makeshift office is in the basement and we're a little bit cold. But his point really is that pastors and elders who oversee and lead a church should labor, should work hard, should expend much energy exactly as this verse says by that word, labor. I don't actually think that very many pastors are or elders are lazy, and neither does Alistair Begg. He knows that most work very, very hard. But he, it was interesting that he did spend a while in these verses talking not just to the church family at large, but to the pastors and elders. Now the next phrase, we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. If anyone is ever tempted to have an attitude that says, Ain't nobody ever going to tell me what to do with some sort of a scowl or a frown. Or I'm my own person. Nobody, nobody, nobody is over me. Or it's, it's just me and Jesus and he's the only one over me. No one else will ever be over me. Then such a person would do well to read these verses where it actually uses that phrase, over you in the Lord. Showing that some people are over you in the Lord and can and should lead you and even admonish you. Now a verse like that could be easily abused and hopefully that would never be the case around here. Around here I'd immediately then like to remind us that 1 Peter 5 verse 3 says to the pastors and elders who are over you and the Lord to not be domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock. If you ever move to a different city someday and you find yourself in a church in the future where the lead pastor or other pastors or elders are domineering or are abusing their position, you would have every right to hold them to account. And if their abusive and domineering ways are so ingrained in the culture of that church that no positive change can be made, then you should leave that church and leave that situation. May it never be said among us that the leadership is domineering. 
On the one hand, 1 Thessalonians 5 does speak of pastors and elders being in spiritual authority. It says, over you in the Lord. But on the other hand, they must never, ever abuse such a concept. They're to serve with humility, leading by example, exercising oversight in love, and not in any sort of abusive or domineering way. And it should only be in the Lord, in accordance with the Lord's word. Then to conclude this first point on these first couple verses, we read in verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Esteeming someone is one thing. Esteeming them very highly in love is an even greater thing. And that's the call of verse 13. And notice similarly to how verse 12 mentioned their labor, verse 13 says, esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So there is another implication that those who are in spiritual authority, pastors and elders, should be known for their good hard work, their labor of love, their leadership by example, servant leadership, and good hard honest work. I liked how Alistair Begg summarized these verses in a memorable way, saying these verses really teach us about the attitude of those being led and about the activity of the church leaders. The activity of the church leaders is to be hard work, labor, and love. And the attitude of the church congregation should be that of respect and esteem and love. Mainly here at Lansing, I would just say, keep it up. Keep up what we're doing because we do pretty well in this area. Sure, there's room for improvement like there is in every area of life. So if you are convicted by these verses in any way, then turn to God in prayer, make the appropriate adjustments. But I've spent enough time on them for now for myself because I would be the first to agree it could appear self-serving as a pastor to go up and talk about these verses and go on and on and on and on any further about how you should respect and esteem pastors and elders. But I'm just trying to be faithful to God's word. Obviously not going to skip over these verses altogether. We need to look into them. Look at these key words and phrases that God has written for our instruction and for our application. There's a little explanation and application of the first little section of our passage today. I'm glad that I can laugh at Reverend No Respect or the unappreciated pastor's tweets and Facebook comments because they are funny because they don't hit anywhere close to home. We have a good thing going on here at Lansing with mutual love and respect, mutual working together right now, weathering this social distancing storm together, eager to get back together in person to keep serving the Lord together in love. Mainly, I'd just say, Lansing, let's keep it up. Final sentence of verse 13 says, Be at peace among yourselves. As you may know, being at peace with one another, living peaceful lives, living in unity, loving one another, is a very, very common instruction given to churches in the Bible. This instruction is repeated so often because it is easier said than done. Living peacefully and loving one another might sound natural and easy, but in any group of people, sports teams, clubs, committees, even churches, it's not easy because the more people you have in a group, the more differing perspectives and personal preferences and personality types come out and there's, there more, there's more different ways of looking at things and, and some of those different perspectives and preferences and personalities can clash with each other and they can create conflict and disagreement. And so the Bible tells us again and again and again, live in unity. Love one another. Put others' preferences above your own like Jesus did and be at peace among yourselves. That'd be good instructions for any group of people you're with, sports team, club, committee, especially in a church family. It's noteworthy that this command to be at peace with one another comes right on the heels of the verses we've just gone through, verses 12 and 13, about respecting the leadership. And it's, it makes sense because it's much, much better for church leaders if a church family is living together in harmony and unity. 
Despite all of our different perspectives and preferences and personality types, we are members of the same body, the same church family, following the same Lord Jesus, indwelt by the same Holy Spirit, adopted by the same God the Father. So let us live at peace with one another. Bear with one another in love. When someone thinks or does things much differently than you would prefer, 1 Peter 3.11 even says, Seek peace and pursue it. Work at it. Pursue it. Chase after it. Pursue peace the way a dog pursues a bone. Pursue peace the way an Olympic sprinter pursues the finish line. Pursue peace the way a football fan pursues the couch on Sunday afternoon. Pursue peace the way scientists are pursuing a vaccine. Pursue peace the way you pursue the final chip in the potato chip bag. Pursue peace peace with one another, with effort and vigor and determination, seeking very hard to be at peace with one another. When we're at peace with one another, it's good for yourself, it's good for your leaders, it's good for your Christian witness, it's good for our collective Christian witness, and it's good for the glory of God. Lansing, be at peace among yourselves. In these days, in the days to come, when we meet back together, the next time you're in a group, the next time you have a preference that others don't share, be at peace among yourself. If some grudge or negativity or complaint to towards someone else in the church family comes to your mind right now or later today, let it go. Forgive. Consider it Water under the bridge. Let bygones be bygones. Forgive and forget. Move on in peace and give that person or those people a happy handshake or a big bear hug the next time you see them when all this social distancing is over. Now let's move on to verse 14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak and be patient with them all. When studying and carefully observing the different words of this passage this past week, something that really stuck out to me is that Paul is urging the brothers to do what he's saying in this verse. Because I had often thought of this as primarily something that pastors or elders of a church were supposed to do. But I realized this week that God actually isn't addressing this verse just to church leadership, but to everyone. He says brothers, which is an old-fashioned term to mean brothers and sisters. It means everyone in the Lord, men and women, we should all be doing this verse 14. Not just the pastor. Everyone should do verse 14. I've often kind of thought of this as maybe mainly being what the pastor should do, similarly to how Ephesians 4.12 says that the pastors, the shepherds and teachers, are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so I thought, you know, similar to that, the pastors, the shepherds and teachers, they're supposed to admonish and encourage and help. But upon paying closer attention this past week, I see it says brothers, brothers and sisters, meaning everyone in the church family, we are all to do verse 14 here, not just pastors. We're all to do these three things. Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, and help the weak. And overall, be patient with all of them. Admonish the idle. Admonish is actually the same word as in verse 12 about pastors and elders admonishing, so they too should be admonishing the idle. But not just them. Everyone should do this. So pause and think for a second. Do you know a Christian friend who is idle or who seems to have stalled out in their walk with the Lord or they used to be involved in church ministry or the Elgin Street Mission or the Pregnancy Care Center or some other ministry but have become idle? If you think of someone, don't then think to yourself, oh, I need to contact one of the pastors and get one of the pastors to talk to that person. No, think to yourself, I personally need to call that person this week, see how they're doing, and help them, admonish them even. The word admonish is often translated as warn in some versions of the Bible, such as in Acts 20 verse 31, Paul says that he didn't cease night or day to warn or admonish 
everyone with tears. When you think of talking to your idle friend, it's not about giving them a verbal slap of reprimand or making them feel bad. It's about helping them, admonishing them, warning them out of love to get back on track. Number two, encourage the faint-hearted. Leon Morris in his commentary on these verses say, the first point has to do with pulling up of slackers. The second is concerned rather with exercising tenderness towards the discouraged. Don't jump too quickly to the thought that your Christian friend is an idle slacker. First consider that possibly he or she may simply be faint-hearted or discouraged and in need of tender encouragement. This verse says to be patient with everybody in, any situ- in all these situations, be patient with them all. So already you should be patient with someone even if you think they're idle, but be especially patient and ascertain whether they're simply maybe just discouraged. Don't discourage them further by getting on their case or making them feel bad in a negative way. Encourage, encourage them. Admonish the idle. Yes, admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help them out, which moves us into the third phrase, help the weak. Helping the weak has to do with standing by someone, holding on to them, helping them through the difficulties of life. Helping them know that they belong, that they are loved by you and God and the church family. Don't abandon the weak. Don't write them off. Help them. Do you know someone who needs help right now? And once again, no matter what the situation is, be patient with people in any and all of these situations. Sometimes it's hard to know who's idle, who's discouraged, who's weak. So it's hard to know whether they need admonishment, encouragement, or help. But if you approach each person with patience, you can figure out just what they need and how you can best spur them on in their Christian life. The New Living Translation has a nice translation of these verse, verse, uh, this verse getting some of the same point across with some synonyms saying, Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, and be patient with everyone. I also like the message paraphrase of these, this verse, which says, Our counsel is that you warn the freeloaders to get a move on, gently encourage the stragglers, and reach out for the exhausted, pulling them up to their feet. Be patient with each person, attentive to individual needs. And now let's move on to verse 15. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another, and to everyone. In the midst of admonishing and warning and encouraging and helping each other and going back to verse 13, being at peace with one another, make sure not to repay evil for evil. Don't hold grudges. Don't repay evil for evil. Seek to do good to everyone. It should come as no surprise that our Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect example of someone who did not repay evil for evil but did what was good for everyone. When our Savior was arrested and beaten and crucified, he did not revile anyone. He did not look for payback or hold a grudge. He did what was good for everyone, including even his enemies. So in the midst of lots of instructions in today's passage, including respect and esteem and love and hard work and being at peace and admonishing and encouraging and helping people and being patient. Let us not lose sight of Jesus Christ or start to think that we need to do all of these things in our own power and somehow work up the power within us by our own strength. Rather, keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, even in today's passage, remembering that he is the author and perfecter of our faith. It's good to get our eyes on today's passage in God's word about respect and esteem and love and hard work and being at peace and admonishing and encouraging and helping people and being patient. It's good to get our eyes on this passage. It's also good to get our eyes on ourselves 
and examine ourselves for where we may fall short according to these verses and in these areas. Where do we need to change and grow? But at the end of the day and at the end of the sermon here, let us also rise up and get our eyes up on our Savior. If you fall short in one or more of these areas, as we all do, get your eyes up on the Savior. Remember that He loves you and forgives you, not on the basis of your performance, but on the basis of His death on the cross to pay for your sins. But then don't use His love and forgiveness as an excuse to ignore these verses or fail to grow in obedience. Use His love and forgiveness and His power in your life to empower you to grow in your new life in Christ, to make progress in all of these areas from verses 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. So let's put our eyes on the text this morning like we've done. Examine what God says to us. Let's put our eyes on ourselves. Examine ourselves where we need to learn and grow. But then let's very quickly get our eyes back up on our Savior, remembering his forgiveness and remembering that he's the one who empowers us to be able to make progress in these areas that this verse, these verses cover. Let's close in prayer. Father God, what we know not, teach us. What we see not, show us. And what we are not, make us. For your glory. Amen. Amen.